It takes a special breed to be a truck driving man And a steady hand to pull that load behind Dave Hamilton out of Salt Lake called me today to give me a friendly reminder, reminder and I, I really appreciate this, Dave. Okay, that right there is a shaft, that shaft we were looking at, that's out of number two. We've cut the other end off for some reason to make a tool or whatever. So that goes inside the block and the oil comes through this hole and then up through this one. So a D343 also has this hole plugged. Let me see. Can you see the... I don't know if you can see. Yeah, there we go. See the ball down there? It's staked in there. So that's got to get removed on a 1693 with a retarder. So this is the piece that uh, was in the flywheel cover, and this is uh, where it would go when you put the cover on. It's going to go up the center of the shaft. Because this isn't a retarder machine, it has that ball in there. So on old Kenny over here, it's a retarder one. That ball is not in there, so this fits in there quite snug. So I do have to get that ball out, and the reason is 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 this device right here supplies lubrication oil for this rear seal now this uh has three it has two other drain backs this is not a drain back this thing goes right here so the oil comes through and it comes down this drilled passage into here and it lubricates this seal now when the retarder's running, you can get up to over 100 PSI inside here in this rotor. So you've got a brass piston ring seal that holds that pressure here and one here. So if you get leakage past here, you can't have all that pressure in here. So down in the bottom, there's two drilled passages that drain back, one on each side and back into the crankcase. And that's going to drain any leakage oil from the brass seal and it's going to drain the oil, the lube oil that constantly comes through for this seal. So in the truck retarders and the scrapers, they also have a poppet valve. And this is the poppet valve in the truck one. In the scrapers, uh, they run five gallons per minute through the circuit to lube the seals. But in the truck, they only uh, allow one U.S. gallon per minute through. And that is to lubricate the two brass seals in here so I got to figure out how to get that uh, ball bearing in there that's staked in out of that passage. Dave said he reached in there with a cutting torch and carefully obliterated it till he could get it out. Um, I don't know any other way you could get it out so that's probably what I'm gonna do. All right so I got most of my mess cleaned up here. I got rods off the pistons, got the sleeves all out. Uh, got to do something with that oil pump and all the bolts that are in the bottom of the pan. Got to throw them in the bucket. Block's ready to go outside and get steam cleaned. I poked the good rods in the barrel here with all of my other stuff. Just in case somebody needs something, and I gotta throw it away. block all cleaned up looking good uh, I think this will be an excellent block we'll find out uh, gonna take it down to my dealer they got a 25 million dollar new facility they can do the deck and I don't know if they can do the line bore a lot of people have asked me about a crankshaft um, 
I've still got old Kenny's crankshaft. I can certainly have it checked and see if it'll go again or if it needs ground. If it does, I can do that. But this is my crank collection. This is the no good one I just took out of that other engine. I got two more in the back. I think one of them's already 20 under. Um, but anyway, I got two more 1693s out back. I could tear down for crankshafts if I need to. So anyway, I'm not sure I want them to hot tank this and remove all that paint from the inside. So generally what I do is I get a wire wheel and the grinder and I can take all the paint off of it that way. And then I use a lot of prep saw to get all the grease out of the cast iron pores before I paint it. But this engine, I'm not just gonna paint plain old cat yellow. This one's gonna get a high dollar paint job, which means uh, it'll probably get primed first and then painted. I still haven't decided exactly what color I'm painting this truck, um, but that'll be a decision I make here soon. Okay, if you're gonna work on engines, uh, 1693, one of the tools you need is a dowel puller and so what I've been doing here is pulling the dowels out these two are out of the front cover this one's out of the front of the block guides the spacer plate down and this one is the one right here in the back so you can see the size of the hole in it there but when it comes out it's only this big so this is believe it or not this is the main oil supply for the entire both camshafts but I'm going to show you why I'm pulling these out. They got to come out of the deck because the deck's got to get milled. So they got to go. But I'm pulling them out of the back and the front and everywhere else for a reason. And I'm going to show you that reason. Pulls them out. Piece of cake, man. Don't know how I lived without this. So you're asking yourself, Jeff, how do you know where those go and how do you know which ones go? Well, for a lot of useless information like that, I'm going to rely on the parts book. Parts books, cat parts books, especially the old ones, are really good for telling you the length of the dowel. But I know from these holes that, that I've got dowels that go in here. Uh, it's just something on the checklist you have to do. Make sure you got them all in. Okay, so there's all the dowels that I pulled out of the block, except for this one up here. That one must have stuck in the spacer plate. So I think, yeah, I'm going to be missing one up here in the rear left corner. And I'm pretty sure I got some brand new ones. So John Lindquist, he's out of uh, Illinois. He came out and visited me, what's it been, John, a year or two ago? But he sent me some stuff. Now, up until he gave me this, we would use those Scotch-Brite roller lock pads on here uh, to remove gaskets, and they literally remove metal. So you don't want to do that. So what he did is he sent me these like plastic bristle pads and they're good for um, removing gaskets. Anyway, there's three of them. And then what was even cooler is he laminated this supply list and what I should use them. So green you use on head block manifolds, yellow on soft metals, aluminum, and the white on extremely light metals. So. Anyway, let's find out how that green one works on here. Okay, we still takes quite a bit to get the gaskets wore off, but I want to show you, you can actually still see 
the machine finish on here. It's not gone. Can you see the machine marks in that? What we're looking for here is a, a ridge that you could feel. And you can see where the liners were touching, but there was no ridge. Okay, this is a, an old liner out of the Filthy Whore, and you can see there's absolutely no uh, erosion, uh, no cavitation marks. Uh, this is a brand new liner over here. So, part of the reason that I think my scraper liners are so clean is number one, we use a, a really good pre-mixed antifreeze. It's a fleet guard, uh, so with a premix, they control the water that's in it, uh, so it doesn't have all the hard water and nasty stuff that you would with a non premix. Anyway, it also has lots of good grounds on the scraper, lots of contact points on it. We run a two aught cable off the block to the frame. Uh, because electrical, bad electrical grounds can cause it also. So, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, counter bores and the way Cat sets theirs up with a flat deck and a spacer plate. So, in a regular diesel engine, Cat, I think, is the only one that does this, a uh, regular engine this block would be a half inch taller and then this liner would sit clear or uh, the block would sit here and the liner goes down into the counter bore. With a Caterpillar it's a flat deck and then what you got to do is you got to put a spacer plate on there to make up this gap here. So you put a 8 thousandths thick metal uh, gasket shim, the spacer plate, then your head gasket goes on and your head bolts down and the reason that liner protrusion is so important is because your head is going to pinch right here on the top of this liner and this is going to hold most of your uh, combustion pressure, firing pressure. Your head gasket sits, the fire ring on your head gasket sits here, it's just a metal piece that sits on here. And so this is all designed that when you put the head on and bolt it down, there's a certain amount of compression that the gasket's going to take. So you're going to compress that gasket down and then the head's going to pinch right here on the top of this liner. So if this liner is not a, a specified height, uh, installed height with the shim gasket and the spacer plate on, then if that liner is down, the head can't pinch it around here and it's going to put all that firing pressure and heat on this firing and that's not going to hold that firing pressure. So what it's going to do is it's going to start to come across here. It's going to burn this firing, which is not very thick, and then it's going to move over and go right down into a water hole and then you're going to get uh, pressurization of your cooling system, you got a blown head gasket. So there's a couple ways to repair these. Uh, Caterpillar offers what they call a shim. So they can sit on here with a unit and they can cut this down and they can put a stainless shim in. And the thinnest shim that you want to use is I think it's a 30, 30 31 thousand shim. Uh, the other, and that's a good, that's a good repair if the engine's still in the vehicle and you don't want to take it clear out. But that also, that's not going to work if your deck is fretted. Uh, let's say it's, it's been run a long, long time. Uh, let's say the head's warped, the deck needs surface. Shims ain't going to fix it. Uh, in that case, you're going to take the whole thing out and uh, if it's been cut for shims before, what they'll do is they'll come in here and they'll bore down and they'll press a sleeve in here and then cut this back to size in here and then when they mill the deck off, it'll cut all the top off smooth and then you end up with a virgin surface. So on a 1693, you can do this to a certain extent and still get the drive shaft 
in that runs the camshafts. On a C15, you've got gears, and so you gotta have a certain amount of backlash in those gears, and every time you mill the head or the deck, that backlash gets eliminated because the gears come closer together. So they use an idler gear. I don't know if it's on an accent. I don't know how it moves. It would have to move one way or the other uh, so you can set the backlash. So you're very limited, like on a C15, 3406E, how much you can deck off the block or the cylinder head. On a 1693, you really don't want to take a lot off. You're, I mean, there is a, a limit you can go to, but I have seen uh, cylinder heads that were milled and milled and milled way beyond spec, and you just put shims under the cam bearing blocks, and that raises the camshafts up so you can still get the drive shaft through. So it's super important to properly uh, Cut, cut for shims or deck this. That liner has got to be straight in there. Everything has got to be right or you're gonna have problems. So I'm working on this uh, micrometer that David Bird sent me. And this is the cap that goes over the end and that's how it adjusts is when you screw that cap down, it, it pinches those threads. So I don't have a full four inch checking bar. I have a one inch and a three inch. Now, I don't know if you guys think that's right or wrong, but I got it in there and got it as straight as I can and cranked this barrel down. And I was reading like, I don't know, one thousandths. So I just kept cranking it with the cap off, which lets the outside barrel slip whoop see that they just fell out because that's how lightly they were in there but anyway so all i had to do with those uh, pieces of steel in there was turn that barrel just a little bit until it went just past zero then back it off till it would just barely hold those pieces of metal in there so is that going to get me close enough so my digital micrometer says I'm 3.999995 and then I got out my uh, inside ones and put them together and it says I'm really really close. It's so hard to tell when you start putting something like this together so that's why I went with this 3 inch and the 1 inch but I don't know, maybe I need to get a four inch. Let's go measure some 343 crankshaft. What I'm getting here is, is uh, 4.498. And it's supposed to be 4.4. 4.997. So we're a little bit shy on that. So I'm going to say that what we should have been reading to be exactly right would have been like right there. <laughs> and so we're not, we're like, we're like right in here. And so I'd say we're a couple of thousandths uh, war on the main journals. So if I've got this adjusted correctly, and I guess I could get somebody else to check it, take it to the machine shop. But I'm going to say it'd probably be the best bet to undersize it 25 thousandths. Well, last night during the storm, Apparently, it sent our hooch airborne. <laughs> I went up over the excavator, ended up on the belly dump. I'd say she's totaled. What do you think? Oh, dang it. No, good morning, everybody. Again, it's colder than a well digger's ass. A frozen turd and a dead Eskimo. <laughs> Got a box going out to Michael Ritchie in Ohio. 
and uh, some money to Shane. So there you go, Shane, in the box, headed your way. Thank you, Brother Gonzalez, for the donation. It is a beautiful day. It's a wee bit nippy. It was uh, six below on the parking lot this morning. She's still pretty cold up here, but it's a blast. So way off out there in the distance is the one of the Grand Tetons you can see. And then out there is Grace and Bancroft. And then on over the hill there is uh, Soda Springs. Um, Richard Cogill from across the pond um, sent me something made in the USA. So anyway, he bought and paid for this. Richard, that's really awesome. So the really cool thing about this, Richard, is this is the same company that I bought uh, the, the EGT sensors for the C15. And I bought uh, a twin probe setup so the gauge reads before the turbo and after the turbo. But anyway, he sent me one. This is going to work for 24 volt uh, DC. So that's going to work on, you know, if I put it on the scraper or I put it on the cat. And uh, he sent, uh, he even got the taps and the drill to do this and the weld-in bung. This is the first time I've opened this, Richard, so I haven't, I haven't even opened the box to look at it. Drum roll, please. So this one looks like it's a digital, too. Yep. It's going to be, it's going to be a digital readout. Uh, looks like you can set it. The one in my truck will flash uh, once it gets over a thousand degrees, that's on the hot side. I need to get in there and program it uh, to not flash at a thousand. But anyway, it'll kind of give you a warning when you get above the set amount for it. Um, but anyway, it comes with a it comes with a box to mount it in. That's pretty cool. Not sure. I'll have to read the directions. Not sure sure how you mount this, but I'm assuming you could like. Uh, glue it down or something. Anyway, um, that had to have cost you a few bucks, a few quid, as you would say, Richard. So I'm very grateful for this. Uh, to have some of the best subscribers in the world. Uh, if I tried to put a dollar value on everything you guys have sent me, I'd, it'd probably blow you away, blow me away. Anyway, um, Thank you very, very much for this, Richard. So this is the name of the company, if you'd like to get a hold of them and their phone number. Anyway, go check out their website. This is the place I found the twin probe and the twin readout one for my Kenworth. Um, so if you remember when I did uh, the Kenworth, I ordered the wrong size compression fittings for the probes. And I called these guys back and I told them I needed to return those and then buy some other ones. And they sent me the correct ones for free. Oh, you caught me with a uh, favorite part of the month. I'm changing calendars out. If you'd like a swimsuit calendar, you can go to my store and get that. Uh, tastefully well done uh, like turning this one even more got lots of lots and lots of cool pictures in it old pay dirt stuff kill dozer mr. TD 24 and the red twin stacker machine gun sounds like a German what is it mg 32 machine gun Matt Inhaling a little respirable silica. Ooh, now there's a nice one right there. See, after you get done with this calendar, you can cut the pictures out and hang them in your shop, man.
Okay, so now that we got that important business out of the way, uh, oh, you can get my hats uh, in my store uh, along with the old Kenny coloring books, and the old Kenny hat, uh, and the filthy whore silhouette by going to www.jpaydirt.com. I uh, want to start out on the whiteboard with a gentleman clear from the Czech Republic, Tom Donk from Reykjavik, Reykjavik in the Czech Republic. That's awesome. I uh, love that that you're watching clear over there. Uh, Scott and Steve Gerber from Upton, Wyoming. They're working 24-7 right now. You know, boys, I did that night shift stuff back in the early 90s with the triple six. Uh, out at the crazy government nut site place. Uh, anyway, worked four to midnight in the cold. It was miserable. But the money made up for it. So I hope you guys stay safe and make lots of money. Uh, Coulter Hoyt, he's also from Wyoming, based in Wyoming. Thank you, Coulter. Dean Rao from Wilmington, North Carolina, or Rowe, depending on how you pronounce it. If you're German, it's Rao. Uh, Larry Wiggins from Tehachapi, California. Got lots of friends in Tehachapi. Chris, where have you been hiding? Where, what are you doing? Haven't heard from you. Uh, Charles Hall from Baker City, Oregon. Thank you, Charles. And Travis Lentz from Alta Vis Vista, Iowa. Thank you for subscribing, Travis. Anyway, thank you for purchasing my stuff and helping support me. Uh, that's awesome. Appreciate those of you who've subscribed, picked up a lot of subscribers, and that helps me on this old Kenny build. So keep up the good work.